It is time for my mid-month March wrap-up. Let's jump right in. Hello, beautiful friends. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to the Continuing Chronicles. It is that time of the month where I do a mid-month review of all the books that I have read so far. I like to do mid-month reviews just because typically by the end of every single month I have way too many books to talk about in one video, at least for me. I am very long-winded and so just even having a few books could last a half hour or more. So I like to break it up in between with a mid-month wrap-up and it's a good thing too because I have actually already finished seven books and we are only on March 12th. So we are not even officially halfway through the month. I have definitely plowed through my TBR so I wanted to go ahead and get this up because it is definitely going to be a long one. Now this very first book that I'm going to talk about I actually finished it in February. I think I started this on Friday February 26th and ended up finishing it on the 27th or 28th. I had no idea I was going to fly through it so quickly and so I thought I was going to finish it in the month of March but I didn't and I had already filmed my February wrap-up at that point so I am going ahead and counting this towards March since it was technically on my March TBR. TBR anyway, and that is Since You've Been Gone by Morgan Matson. And I am very happy to say that this is the third Morgan Matson book that I've read, and this is the third Morgan Matson book that I have enjoyed immensely. I'm not sure what I was expecting of this, but I definitely got a lot more than I was bargaining for. So this follows our main character, Emily, and at the very beginning of this book, her best friend Sloane basically vanishes. She doesn't say a word to Emily about where she's going. All Emily knows is that Sloane is gone, her family is gone, they are not in their house, and Emily has no idea where she went. And then suddenly, Suddenly, a few days later, she receives a note in the mail. There is no name attached to it or context or anything, but it is a list. It is a list of things for Emily to do over the summer period. And Emily knows that this letter came from Sloane. This is not the first time that Sloane has sent her a list of this nature. Emily is typically very shy. She is the shy one in their friendship. Sloane is the more outgoing one. She is the more social one. She knows how to navigate like social relationships and interactions. And Emily relied heavily on Sloane for that. So Sloane was always giving Emily these lists of things for Emily to try like when she was going to a new place or something like that. And so Emily has received a list of things that Sloane wants her to do over the summer. And even though a lot of them really terrify Emily, she feels like if she does this list, Sloane will come back to her or she will find Sloane and everything will be right again. So this book is really about Emily checking off all of the things on Sloane's list, but also about the relationships that Emily makes along the way. She makes a lot of great friends on the journey as she is trying to check things off of this list. There's a little romance in here, a new friendship that blooms. So I really just thought that this was such a sweet and well done young adult contemporary. And I felt like it was more substantial than I was thinking it was going to be. Like a lot of the times when I read things in books where there are lists involved, a lot of the things on the list just seem very arbitrary or superficial or ambiguous. Like instead of something very specific, specific, it'll be something very vague, like do something that scares you. But that's not what this list was. This list was very, very specific. And there were reasons that Sloane had made this list. So the list felt like it was substantial in that regard. And I just really enjoyed watching Emily's journey as she kind of comes out of her shell, as she builds these new relationships, as she checks things off this list. And then of course, in the end, when everything is resolved. My one gripe about this, it's probably going to sound kind of weird and maybe a little bit dark. And I don't mean for it to be. And if you don't want any kind Kind of spoiler whatsoever for this. Please fast forward. I will try to remember to put a timestamp right here for when I'm done talking about this. In the end, of course, you find Sloane and you find out the reason why she left. And I feel like in some ways this would have been better and more impactful if Emily had truly lost Sloane in some way. Now, I don't necessarily mean that Sloane had to pass away or anything like that, but I feel like if this had been a more permanent loss, it would have been more impactful. But as it was, because you have no idea why Sloane left, where she went, why she was so rude as to not explain to her best friend, why she was just up and vanishing, you kind of go through this book a little bit irritated and frustrated with Sloane, and you kind of don't want Emily to find Sloane. You fall in love with the characters that she's meeting throughout this book, and you want her to remain in those relationships and those friendships because you don't care about Sloane. You think that she's a terrible friend for what she did. Kind of reminded me a little bit about what happened in Paper Towns by John Green. If you've read that book, you'll kind of know what I mean. The main character in that that goes missing is just utterly selfish, self-absorbed, and I could not stand her. I loved the other main character, the one that went on the journey to find the missing girl, but not the actual missing girl. So when I was reading this, this kind of reminded me of that. And I thought that Sloane was going to be in the same vein. However, once you actually find Sloane and you realize why she did what she did, you don't hate her as much. You can relate to her a little bit. You understand stand. So at the end, she's not nearly as vilified as you think that she would be. However, I think that that still takes away some of the impact that this book could have had if Sloane had truly been gone in some capacity, like maybe moving far away for good or something of that nature. But overall, 
I really, really, really enjoyed this. And I'm so glad because since I'm moving away from YA contemporaries, that this was just going to be a disappointment and it wasn't. So I really think that Morgan Matson is just going to be a staple, solid YA contemporary author for me going forward because I've really enjoyed all of her books that I've read so far and I've given all of them four plus stars. Next, I read Pretty Little Wife by Darby Kane, and I enjoyed this one immensely. This follows our main character, Lila Ridgefield, and in this book, her husband goes missing. And Lila's concern over her missing husband is not what you think it is, because Lila could have sworn she knew where her husband was, because the last time she saw her husband, he was dead. But now he is truly gone, and she has no idea where a dead man could have possibly gone off to. It was that tagline that really hooked me about this book. This was going to be such a twist on the typical, like, domestic mystery thriller plot because you already know who the murderer is in this book and you're trying to figure out what actually happened to the dead man and I just really appreciated the journey of this book. Now I'm going to say that this isn't anything like amazingly shocking or anything like that. I don't think that by the end of this book you're going to be super surprised by anything that happens. I just really enjoyed watching Lila's journey as she tries to figure out what happened to her dead missing husband. You're also following the perspective of the detective that is investigating investigating Lila and she's also investigating the disappearances of some of the women that have gone missing around town and they think that Lila's husband's disappearance is connected to these missing girls. You find out more about why they think it's connected, what's going on, why Lila might have killed her husband and things of that nature and this was just a ride. I loved how dark and disturbing the tone of this was and I just kind of admired Lila. I know that you're probably going to think I'm very very weird but Lila was steadfast. She had no regrets about what she did. She found out something terrible about her husband and she took action because she knew that taking action was going to save herself as well as other vulnerable people. And she did not flinch. And when the police talked to her, she did not flinch. She stood and held fast and she did not crumble under the pressure and she was willing to do what she had to do. And I just really admired her about that. I thought she was a fascinating character to be in the mind of and to watch. And I just overall really appreciated the journey of this. So when it comes to mystery thrillers, because I've been reading them for so long, I don't necessarily need them to be ultra surprising because most of them just never are. I found this overall to be a fairly interesting and unique premise. I don't need it to be surprising. What I need it to be is engaging and entertaining and I need to have some kind of interest in the characters and I absolutely did for this. I just wanted to be reading this all the time. I would go and force myself to do things just so I could be listening. I wanted to find out what happened. So this really didn't disappoint. I ended up giving this a four star and I will absolutely be picking up more from Darby Kane in the future. I believe she's got a new release coming out maybe this year or next and I am here for it. Next, I read The Line Between by Tosca Lee. This was the very first book that I ever received in my Peace and Pages bookish subscription service. And this was a really interesting book. This follows our main character, Winter Raw. And at the very beginning of this book, she's basically being thrown out of a doomsday cult that she had been a part of since she was just a young girl, I believe seven years old. When she was just seven years old, her mother brought her and her older sister to this doomsday cult. And this is what she's been a part of for 15 years. So now at the beginning of this book, Winter is 22. She doesn't know life outside of this cult whatsoever and of course you know they don't refer to themselves as a cult or anything like that that's not how she knows of this group all she knows is that she's being shunned and tossed out of the only family that she has ever known her mother is dead her sister is fully basically indoctrinated into this cult her sister also has a child that is now part of this cult as well and winter is just lost and she doesn't know what to do she ends up staying with an old friend of her mother's and she's just trying to adjust to life outside and all of the things that happen that she is not used to, that she's been thoroughly sheltered from. But something starts to happen in the world. People are going mad. It's like the sudden outbreak of early onset dementia. So people of all ages are just suddenly basically losing their minds. And obviously, as you can imagine, the nation is just descending into chaos. And it was really interesting to read this during this time because of course, all of you know, for the past year, we have been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the stuff that happened in here has happened in real life and it kind of really makes you think about what would happen if something worse than COVID-19 were rampaging the United States because in this this was not even a pandemic this was an epidemic so not nearly the scope of COVID-19 but it was far worse and so everybody was going absolutely crazy they were looting they were rioting they were hoarding they were doing all kinds of things some of those things that you did see during the COVID-19 pandemic so it was really really fascinating 
fascinating to read this during this time, especially since I believe this was written before COVID-19. It kind of makes you paranoid. It kind of makes you want to go and stock up on toilet paper and all of the essentials because you just never know like if something terrible like early onset dementia, like if there was an epidemic of that nature in the United States, what would actually happen? And so Winter Roth is not only having to deal with trying to figure out life on the outside of this cult, an outside life that she's never experienced before. You know, she's never had a cell phone. She's never seen all of this news. She, she doesn't have any experience, but now she's also having to deal with this epidemic. Then one day her sister shows up at her door with these medical vials and they've come to the realization that these medical vials could be the answer to whatever is ailing everybody. And she needs to get these vials to somebody in Colorado that Winter's sister knew and knows could help. And so it's about Winter's journey trying to get to this guy in Colorado and the people that she meets along the way and everything that she has to go through. And it was just a journey. It was a wild ride and I really enjoyed it. This was absolutely a page turner. It will keep you enthralled from the very beginning to the very end. I definitely really, really enjoyed this. I would say that there was so much going on in this. Toscally really tries to explain exactly how these medical vials end up with Winter's sister. They were first owned by the head of the cult. Like Toscally tries to tie it all together and make you understand but I felt like it was kind of a leap. I felt like it really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I felt like there could have been more information regarding this. I really didn't truly understand how the leader of this cult ended up with these. I didn't really understand anything related to that at all. And then they were also trying to explain like the science behind what was causing the early onset dementia. And it just kind of went over my head. So I really feel like there could have been more information. There could have been more details described here and maybe a more plausible reason as to why there are these medical vials that Winter has to get to this guy in Colorado. It just seemed really all too convenient. The fact that Winter's sister had these medical vials, broke out of the cold, found Winter, gave her the vials and say, I know the one person that's going to know exactly what to do with these. You have to get them to him. It just was a little bit of a stretch to me. So that was my main gripe in here. And like I said, this book tried to do a lot because you're getting glimpses into Winter's current life as she's trying to adjust outside the cold, but you're also getting flashbacks to her during her life in the cold. So you really get a very interesting glimpse into cult life life. And I don't know about you, but I have watched a lot of documentaries on cults. You know, I know all about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. There's also Heaven's Gate. And of course, there's Jonestown and the Mansons and all of that stuff. So I have watched a lot of documentaries on this stuff. I thought it was very well portrayed in here. I did really, really, really enjoy that. And I'm glad that it was included in. But I feel like because there was so much going on, some of the important things that you needed to know in order to understand why what was happening was happening, I felt like they were just kind of pushed to the side. And I would have liked a little bit more detail detail. But because I enjoyed the reading experience of this so much, and like I said, it was a page turner. It just kept you going. It was very easy to read and fly through. I did give this a solid four stars. I believe this is a duology and I will definitely be picking up the second book because this ended extremely abruptly. Like it ended and I had no idea how they could justify ending it there. Not because it was really ended on a cliffhanger, but just because it, I felt like it ended on a very awkward spot. So I will definitely be picking up the second and final book in this duology just to see how it ends and see like how the world is faring in the future after the early onset dementia maybe has subsided and what, what the world is looking like today. So highly recommend if you are interested in these types of books. Again, a solid four out of five stars. Then on a whim, I decided to pick up Phantom Limbs by Paula Gardner. This is one of those books that has been sitting on my TBR for a very long time. It's one of those books that I'm, I wasn't sure about, but I love the premise of it so much that I could never quite get myself to get rid of this. This is a harder hitting YA contemporary. It follows our main character, Otis. This book is entirely from his perspective. And basically a few years Years ago, his best friend in the entire world, Meg, somebody that he was actually in love with and they were developing a relationship, up and moved away with her family and he never heard from her again. And this came on the heels of the death of his baby brother, who was, I believe, just three when he died by a very, very tragic accident. And so this tragic accident affected both Otis's and Meg's family very, very deeply. And I think in order to cope, Meg and her family just kind of took off and they just kind of disassociated themselves from Otis and Otis's family. Now it is three and a half years later and Otis is a high school champion swimmer and he is being trained by Dara. Dara is a little bit older than him. Dara was in a former Olympic hopeful, but her dreams were kind of dashed when she lost her arm to a shark attack. And now she's kind of putting all of her hopes and dreams into Otis and she's training him very, very hard because she wants him to get to the Olympics. And suddenly Otis, after three years, hears from Meg and Meg tells Otis that she will be returning with her dad and, you know, they want to meet up and hang out and all of that stuff. And it really goes from there. So primarily this is about Otis and Meg reconnecting, but I mentioned Dara because she is also a focus in here too. She's not a part of the Otis and Meg relationship, but Otis and Dara have a very close connected relationship 
relationship, they are like the very best of friends. And Dara has some extreme issues as well, because like I said, she lost her arm. So she has, she is the one with the phantom limbs. And that is something that you don't ever really see in books. I've never read once about like an amputee and the phantom limb pain and what that means and how you could help solve it. And that was just very fascinating to dive into. So this is disability rep that I don't often see. So you see the dynamics between Otis and Dara and all of the issues that Dara has, because not only is she dealing with that, but she's dealing with the father who doesn't really love or appreciate her, who is always very disappointed in her. Dara is very much on her own and she's dealing with so, so much and she leans very heavily on Otis. And then of course you have Otis's family who has basically been broken by the death of his younger brother via that very tragic accident. They've just been trying to heal and move on. And now Meg is coming back into the picture and you're following Otis and her as they reconnect and everything like that. This is another book that I ended up enjoying a lot more than I thought that I was going to. And I'm so glad because one of the reasons I kept this was because I thought that it was going to be a, one of those harder hitting YA contemporaries that I just love so much. And it really, really was. This was a very beautiful exploration of grief and what it does to people and how it changes people. Because Meg in this book also has some post-traumatic stress after what happened. And you find out more about that and why she left. And so it's just all about that grief and how it changes relationships and people and dynamics. And I thought that this was a wonderful exploration of that. And I don't want to say like I enjoyed reading about it, but it definitely satisfied what I'm looking in a YA contemporary when I want to read more. So I know that Paula Gardner actually has at least one more book. And I definitely think I want to read at least one more book by Paula Gardner because this is what I'm looking for in a YA contemporary. I thought it was solid, very well done. I liked the characters. I appreciated their dynamics. And overall, I gave this a four stars. So, so far, this has just been a very solid reading month. Um, every single book so far has been a four stars and this was no exception. Then I picked up The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager. Y'all know that I'm really trying to solidify my feelings about Riley Sager. Absolutely hated Final Girls, loved Home Before Dark. And so I wanted to pick this up and see what I felt about it. And I really, really enjoyed this one. So this follows our main character, Emma. When she was just 13 years old, she was at a summer camp called Camp Nightingale. And one night her three roommates basically left the cabin and never returned. They disappeared. They were never found. Nobody knows what happened to them. And this has deeply affected Emma throughout her whole life. She went to therapy and everything like that. She was deeply traumatized by the disappearance of these girls. And now in present day, she actually uses her painting. She's a pretty well-known artist. She's pretty successful. And she kind of hides the girls in her paintings. She uses her paintings as a way to express herself. And then one day she is approached by Franny. Franny is the owner of Camp Nightingale. She plans on reopening Camp Nightingale and she wants Emma to return as a paint teacher. So Emma decides that she is going to return to Camp Nightingale because she wants to find out what happened to those three girls. So she returns to Camp Nightingale and it goes from there on her journey to discover what happened to the three girls that went missing. Now, I want to say that for the majority of this book, I was very lukewarm about it. Like I wasn't hating it at all. I was enjoying my reading experience of it, but I wasn't really connected to it or just like super enthralled. It was really the ending of this that got me. It went in a different direction than what I thought. Riley Sager in this book tosses a million characters at you. There are so many characters that you need to learn and keep straight. And almost every single one of them is a potential suspect. And in some ways, you are also kind of suspicious of Emma herself because you come to find her as somewhat of an unreliable narrator. So you are not sure if she can entirely be trusted. So you are following Emma as well as the other people at the camp as Emma tries to figure out what is going on and what happened to these three girls. And like I said, basically everybody is a suspect and you have no idea who could have possibly done this. And so as I was reading it, I had in my mind out of all of the potential suspects, I had three narrowed down. I was like, okay, it is one of these three. And in some ways I was right. It was one of those three in some capacity, but not the end. When you you finally realized what happened to the girls and I didn't see it coming. I thought Riley Sager ended this very, very well, took it in a direction you will probably not predict. At least I didn't predict it. And if you did predict it, I mean, good for you because I wasn't even thinking in this direction when it ended. So I really appreciated the ending. This was definitely atmospheric and it added to the overall experience of reading it, but it really was the ending that cinched it for me. So I did give this four stars. It's not my favorite. I think Home Before Dark is still my favorite Riley Sager, but I definitely enjoyed this way, way, way more than Final Girls. And I'm much more hopeful for Lock Every Door as well as his brand new release. So I will absolutely be continuing with Riley Sager. I am very glad that I read this. I'm very glad that I enjoyed it as much as I did. And again, four stars. I also ended up finishing A Glimmer of Death by Valerie Wilson Wesley. This was a cozy mystery that I actually received as part of the book drop subscription service. I was very nervous going into this because cozy mysteries are not my thing. I ended up enjoying this 
more than I thought, but it's still one of those things that I'm never going to think about again. I'm definitely not going to be continuing in this series when she publishes more. It was just okay. This follows our main character, Odessa Jones. She lost her husband about a year ago. She's still heavily into her grief. To help make ends meet, she ended up getting her realtor's license. And in this book, she's working at Risco Realty. She has several co-workers and then her boss. And her boss is an utter and complete douchebag. And in this book, it is her boss that gets murdered. And so you're really just following her as she starts to uncover what happened to her boss, her interactions with her co-workers who are not the best people. Like none of her co-workers are altogether all that likable. They're all kind of a little bit shady and suspicious. So you're following her as she not necessarily like investigates them. I wouldn't say she's all trying to go out and be Miss Marple or anything like that in this situation, but she's just curious and she starts to find out more because people want to talk to her. And that is actually kind of a gripe that I have in this because Odessa has only been working at this job for six months and yet almost all of the co-workers with the exception of a couple feel like she is their best friend, feel like she's the only one that they can talk to. Like they have nobody else in the world. Only Odessa Jones can possibly be counted on, can possibly be relied upon. So even though she's only been there six months, she doesn't know any of them very well at all. She's suddenly like the staple, stable colleague in here. And I just didn't buy that. It really didn't make a lot of sense to me. I know that it was probably necessary for the progression of this plot, but it just didn't work out very well for me. And also Odessa Jones is supposed to be somewhat, I don't want to use the term psychic just because it's not like she can see the future, but she has these gifts, these special abilities that allow her to sense certain things. Like she sees glimmers around people when they are feeling a certain way or behaving a certain way. She can sense death because she smells nutmeg whenever death is present. And she kind of inherited these gifts from her aunt. Like her aunt Phoenix can also see glimmers and things like that. And her aunt Phoenix kind of has this really deep intuition and always seems to know exactly what's going on in Odessa's life and can kind of predict the lottery numbers and things like that. However, this gift didn't really play almost any part in this book and it's not helpful at all like it's not something that she can control and it's not even like it helped her investigate this or determine who the murderer was or anything so I really don't know why that had to be a part of this book I don't feel like it added anything whatsoever it was just kind of confusing because the glimmers are never explained you never really know what they are and even her aunt doesn't even really know what they are I feel like this was added just to make it maybe a little bit eclectic or kitschy or something like that it just didn't really work for me so when I was reading this I thought that this was well written and I feel like the author did a really good job of fleshing out all of the characters. There were quite a few characters. This is a very small book. This is only 224 pages, but you really feel like you get to know the characters, not connect with them. I don't think this is the type of book that you connect to the characters. I don't think you really meant to. They're given a little bit of backstory and context and history and things like that. So I really feel like she did a good job of making you know and understand the characters. So I really applaud that. And because it's really hard to do with such a short book, but overall, this just didn't do much for me. And like I said, I'll probably never think about it again. I won't remember it. I'm definitely not continuing. So this was just a three stars and I'm pretty sure it's getting put on the end hall pile. The seventh and final book is one that I'm actually currently reading. However, I only have one hour of listening time in the audiobook left. I was hoping to finish it before filming this video, but it just did not work out that way. But unless something like super crazy happens, I'm pretty sure that my rating for the book is going to be four stars. And that is How to Make Friends with the Dark by Kathleen Glasgow. Kathleen Glasgow wrote Girl in Pieces, which I read early last year and really enjoyed. That was another hard hitting contemporary and I knew this one was going to be the same and I wanted to read it to see if Kathleen Glasgow could be another staple YA contemporary author since she does tend to write really dark hard hitting YA contemporaries and I'm glad to say that so far she definitely is and I'm actually enjoying this one more than I did Girl in Pieces. This follows our main character Grace Tolliver. She goes by Tiger and it has always been Tiger and her mother against the world. Tiger never knew her father. She doesn't have any siblings. Her grandparents are dead so really it is just her and her mother. Tiger's mother is really a good mother but she's extremely overprotective and they also kind of have a hard time surviving just because Tiger's mother doesn't make a lot of money so sometimes they don't have a lot of food. Tiger's always wearing like hand-me-down thrifty clothes and things like that but overall they have a really good relationship and Tiger's mother is not like a deadbeat or anything like that. Well one day Tiger and her mom get into a really really bad fight and then the next thing she knows Tiger is being told that her mother is dead. Her mother has had a brain aneurysm and is dead and so all of a sudden Tiger is now an orphan. She 
she's having to deal with the loss of her mother and she is thrown immediately into foster care. So you're following the situation that you cannot possibly imagine. You have this young teenage girl who has just lost her mother. Her mother was her entire world. Her mother was her best friend. And not only that, but the last thing she said to her mother were words of anger and she feels awful. She's just in this huge cloud of grief. But now on top of that, she's being thrown into foster care. This is not a situation that she's ever been in before. She has no idea what to expect. All she knows are the horror stories that she's heard of the foster care system. And so she's being torn away from absolutely everything she knows. She's not being allowed to stay with her best friend, even though her best friend wants her to. So basically within the span of hours, she goes from being a girl with a mother and a home to a motherless girl with no home and no family. And she's tossed in foster care. And I can't even imagine how extremely terrifying that would be. And that's what this book really makes you think of. What would you do if you had absolutely no one, you were under 18, according to the law, you could not take care of yourself. And so you were being forced to live with strangers that you didn't know in not the best circumstances. So this is following Tiger's journey of grief, her experience in the foster care system, and then what happens when some unexpected family comes in to help care for her. And like I said, I have an hour left, but I just really have appreciated and connected to this book because I can't even fathom what Tiger has been going through and it's such a real and raw depiction of grief and what that would feel like and I just think Kathleen Glasgow does that so well. She knows how to write teenagers who are going through extremely difficult times and overall I think that this is just beautifully done and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to give it a four stars. Crazy happens that makes me hate the book or something crazy happens that makes me bump it up to a five stars. I really think that this is a solid four star read. It's a beautiful story and if you have not read Kathleen Glasgow, if you are interested in harder hitting contemporary that do deal with harder topics, I would definitely, definitely recommend. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are the books that I've read so far in the month of March. My reading month is going spectacularly well. All of the books with the exception of Glimmer of Death have been a solid four stars. Like I said, I have two books left on my official TBR for the month of March, and then I can basically read whatever I want. So we'll have to see what I come up with, but I'm excited to just be back in reading and really enjoying what I read. If you have read any of the books that I talked about, please let me know your thoughts. I would love to know. And if I've convinced you to read any of these, please also let me know that as well. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post videos on Tuesdays, sometime Saturdays. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.